Yes, so this morning uh, we're happy to start off with Vide uh, Gaioto from IAS, and he'll talk to us about VPS states in 2D reporting. Okay, so this talk is going to be based on work done in collaboration with uh, <coughs> Greg Moore and Andy Neitzke over the last couple of years, and on some uh, upcoming work with uh, Edward Witten. Now, uh, the main subject of, the, of this talk, or at least the motivation behind this talk, is uh, the fact that four dimensional spin theories with inequal two supersymmetry, which basically means eight square charges, have or are associated to certain interesting integral invariants called BPS degeneracies. Which basically count the number of particles with certain charges uh, which, which propagate in the theory and which preserves a, a certain amount of supersymmetry. Now, uh, these four dimensional theories are the, are the field theory analog or something that might be more familiar to parts of the audience, which are Calabial compatifications. way of that to be string theory. They have a lot of properties in common and sometimes you can study a field theory by start taking certain limits of a Calabriar compatification. And BPS degeneracies or BPS particles on the, on the field theory side correspond on this side to D brains. But <coughs> a sharp difference is that on this side, this is a subject which is mathematically rather well understood. There is a whole theory that is developed or is being still being developed about what does it mean to have a deep brain in a Calabriar compatification. Uh, so you can start looking at sheaves, the right category of sheaves, what's not. On the other hand, uh, unfortunately, I cannot quite tell you what is a good and precise mathematical definition of this BPS degeneracy for field theory. I mean, uh, a trick coupling is pretty clear that there should be a, a rigorous definition in terms of certain indices or cohomology of <coughs> moduli, moduli spaces of monopoles in four dimensions, monopole solutions in four dimensions. But um, I don't quite, I don't think I quite understand how one compute them just from the definition of on their field theory definition uh, for general values of the couplings or in general locations of the vacuum model space of the theory. Uh, on the other hand, so the, we started studying this side of the, of the blackboard because if you are curious about this side of the blackboard, in particular it was a reaction to work from Konstevich and Solomon which derived a, a world crossing formula. Basically, this, the, the this BPS degeneracy, the in these integral invariants, depend on certain continuous parameters, which are typically called stability conditions in math, in math or the choice of vacuum, vacuum for your, for your theory. Uh, they are locally continuous, but they jump across certain walls of marginal stability. And this wall crossing formula by Constitution Solomon just gives you a prediction of what is the value of the invariance on one side of the wall if you know the value of the invariance on the other side of the wall. So it tells you how to cross the walls in, in the space of uh, stability conditions. Now, it was derived or proposed based on the mathematics of uh, <coughs> categories of D-brains. But on the other hand, it seems to apply perfectly well to the field theory side. But nothing in the, w in the tools that they use or uh, the, the mathematical framework suggests a simple connection to field theory. So this was the, the sort of puzzle that started the, the whole 
analysis. Now, in general, so by, by now, there is a, a good number of proofs of the wall crossing formula in field theory. Uh, these proofs as a sort of common team. You deform your theory, modify your theory in some way, in such a way that the, the effect of the modification depends on the BCS spectrum. But at the same time, it continues across a, a wall of marginal stability. This puts a constraint on how the spectrum jumps across the wall. And this constraint, every time, comes back to just give this relation. Um, now, in the process, uh, we've learned quite some, we had quite some fun with learning about various ways of modifying a theory. So we've learned quite a bit about defects in four dimensional field theories with an equal true supersymmetry. Uh, in particular, the, the idea of a surface defect, of a co-dimension true <coughs> defect, proved to be very useful. And uh, also, we got progressively closer to the, to the point where we could not just compute how the BPS spectrum jumps across the wall, but directly compute the BPS spectrum. So um, in the last few weeks, I think we more or less completed the program, and now we know how to compute the BPS spectrum of a pretty generic four-dimensional theory just by looking how it in inter interacts with some defects. And so the purpose of this talk is to present some of the tools that we, that we used. And actually, right. so what do I mean with the defect? So suppose you have a theory some higher dimensional space, say four dimension. Okay. And then you modify your theory locally at some dimension, at some lower dimensional, some lower dimensional locus, say for dimension two locus. Now, because of the properties of field theories, of locality, if you do a local modification to the theory here, you're not going to affect the behavior of far away excitations. So the behavior of the bulk for dimensional theory is an effect as far away from the defect. But you introduce new degrees of freedom, new structure at the defect, and this structure is definitely affected by whatever is going on in the bulk. So by studying defects uh, in, in a, in a four-dimensional theory, you can construct an interesting probe of the dynamics of this four-dimensional theory. Now, um, the uh, a very an important, a useful way, if you want to construct integra integral invariance, or in particular integral invariance that can be associated to, uh, okay. okay, let me say this better. So the typical modification that you can study in a theory is just a point-like operator. You, you modify the theory at one point. And then you can compute things like correlation functions. Uh, this typically produces for you a number, not an, in, not an integer, but a real number, or a complex number. And, you know, but if you want to, to do something to a theory that produces an integer, possibly an integer that can be seen as a dimension of the vector space, it's actually useful to consider one-dimensional deformations of the theory. <coughs> so uh, why is that? So suppose you have a purely one-dimensional problem. Okay, so it's like quantum mechanics. You have a Hilbert space, uh, and you can study the properties. Now, a very familiar setup is supersymmetric quantum mechanics. So it's a situation where your theory has a time translation symmetry generated by a Hamiltonian, and two supercharges, which anti commute the Hamiltonian. So this is a very familiar and very useful setup because uh, if you look at the, at the quantum mechanics with the structure with some discrete spectrum, uh, you have some distinguished states of zero energy which are annihilated by both supercharges. And then above, you have states with non-zero energy becoming doublets of opposite fermion number which are exchanged by the action of the supercharges. 
So uh, starting from, from the work of Witten, it's, it's traditional to, to study the sort of indices, which con receive contributions only from the ground states. Or maybe study the ground states themselves in the form of a Q cohomology. And because ground states can appear or disappear from the spectrum only by only in pairs, the index or the Q cohomology are very robust. So uh, whenever you have a complicated theory, you have one way to break the symmetrics to a Hamiltonian and two square charges in such a way that you have some sort of bound state, some sort of uh, finite discrete quantum mechanical system. Uh, you have a hope to define some interesting, in interesting integers and some interesting vector spaces. So um, now in quantum mechanics, the class a classical example for this is the application to Morse theory. Where you have a quantum mechanics defined by a real superpotential by a Morse function. The supercharges or in some manifold, the supercharges look like e to the minus h d to the h. And then uh, you, can, you can study the cohomology of the manifold by looking at the, at the space of ground states of the sort of quantum, supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Or you can compute the, the order of character of the, of the manifold. Now, um, if you look at the system where you have a one dimensional defect embedded in a bigger theory, uh, something interesting can happen though, because it's possible as you tune the parameters of the four dimensional theory to get to a situation where you have an, an excitation which lives far away from the defect and nevertheless have energy cost very close to zero. Now, when, if this happens, this picture is definitely not valid because you have a continuum of particles which move very slowly, scattering states, which have arbitrarily low energy. You have a continuous spectrum that comes all the way to, to zero energy. And whatever theorems that protect your Q cohomology or index fail. But for generic values of the parameters, typically these faraway excitations have energy bigger than zero. And then you have some continuous at some point above the zero energy. But who cares? So there is a general feature of these systems where as you vary the parameters of your theory, these numbers or these vector spaces can jump. But crucially, the way they jump is always controlled by whatever zero energy excitations were available far away. In a sense, the only way you, you lose or gain states is because they, at some point, they can be represented as a bound state, a very loose bound state of some bulk excitations with your defect. And this bound state radius goes to infinity as you tune the parameters and you lose the state. So, uh, so constructing this sort of one-dimensional defects is a good way to study the BPS particle of your theory. You can, you can identify them, study them by the way they act upon this sort of numbers, which uh, I will call frame BPS degeneracies in general in this talk. So there are sort of BPS states which live at a localized defect in your theory. Now, uh, for most of the talk, I will focus on a two-dimensional example of BPS states and frame BPS states, uh, which, are, which are, so I will study two-dimensional theories with, with so four supercharges, two comma two supersymmetry. In particular, I will study landau ginzburg models. Then towards the end of the talk, I will embed these two-dimensional systems inside a four-dimensional system. And so I will have sort of chains of relations. I have one-dimensional systems which are affected by two-dimensional BPS states. And then four-dimensional BPS states affect the behavior of these two-dimensional BPS states. So ultimately, I compute four-dimensional BPS degeneracies. But I will do it by studying one-dimensional problems embedded in two dimensions embedded in four dimensions. So what is a Landau-Ginsburg theory? To define a Landau-Ginsburg theory, you need two pieces of data 
you need a manifold, a Taylor manifold. Say a complex plane, for example. I would denote points in this manifold in and some x. And you need a superpotential. is an holomorphic function from your manifold to C. Say, in this case, would be a, polyno a polynomial. <coughs> in general, this polynomial, this potential, has parameters that come, into, come in families. So it has some interesting parameter space. and not as key. And although the landau gibbs model is defined starting with this data, my purpose would be to, to show how much of the physics can be just derived by looking at the, at the properties of the parameter space. Now, uh, so given this data, you can build a Lagrangian for a three-dimensional sigma model with certain amounts of supersymmetry and blah, blah, blah. But so what are the basic properties of this theory? One assumption I will make is that gener for generic values of the parameters, the critical points of the superpotential, uh, which are denoted xi, are non-degenerate. So at some quarter dimension one logi in parameter space, some of the critical points might coincide, and you can get might, might get might get uh, degenerate critical points. So for example, here when z goes to zero, uh, the potential becomes cubic. Now, um, if you th this assumption is uh, is useful because I want to study a massive three-dimensional theory, a theory which does not have uh, light degrees of freedom. And the vacua of the lambda Gibbs model on the real line are just given by a choice of, vac of critical point of W. And then the, the mass of, of elementary excitations around this vacua are controlled by the second derivatives of W. So you want, I want to have a massive, a theory which is massive, a generic points in the, in the parameter space. Now, this, this doesn't mean that there are no uh, supersymmetric particles. Now, uh, because the, the supersymmetry algebra are forms of charges, as I was saying. The supersymmetry algebra involves both the Hamiltonian, but also a certain central charge. Uh, so it's possible for a state that has no, no zero energy to, to, to still be annihilated by some supercharges. Now, these BPS particles take the form of solitons, where you have some smooth field, semi-classical, you have some smooth field configuration, which interpolates between two different choices of, of vacuum. So uh, this, this BPS solitons, satisfy some differential equation, which is basically a gradient flow equation. So, uh, so the BPS solitons are states of the theory, uh, which are killed by some of the supercharges. Which combination of supercharges depends on the phase, alpha? And uh, the condition, classically the condition to annihilate some supercharges can be written as this differential equation. Sorry, I should have written this as capital X. So I, I denote the coordinate on the real line 
at x. So I go from x equal to minus infinity to plus infinity. And I hope that my calligraphic x and uh, capital X is. So they will, of course, occasionally uh, get confused. Sorry for the notation. So these uh, this differential equations, Kevin's flow equations, have an interesting property. They have a conserved quantity. Because if you multiply them by the derivative of x respect of by the x, the capital X or the little x, um, you discover that the imaginary part of w to the minus alpha is constant. And the real part of w to the minus i alpha grows monotonically. So uh, what this means is that so if, you just, if you just start at some generic point in the manifold and you flow, the flow will just bring you to infinity in a finite amount of space. If you want to find solutions that go, that are well defined on the whole real line, so that asymptote at a very small x and a very large x, uh, I mean, it's easy to see that they are two asymptotes and a very large x and a very small x at some critical point. Furthermore, so, so the, these trajectories in the W plane look like straight lines with certain slope coming out of the critical points. And unless you're lucky and you hit another critical point, uh, you're just going to go to infinity in a finite amount of space. So these solitons only exist if alpha is tuned so that uh, the value of, of the subpotential at the two critical points is real and layered in there. So as you, as you tune this parameter alpha, sometimes you, you find a BPS, a BPS state, a BPS polyton, which interpolate between two vacuum. And uh, it's not difficult to study how, this, how the number of these solitons jump as you vary the say the parameters for the super potential. And this was uh, done for generality by Chekotin Waffer, for example. But um, I in this now I would like to show you how to derive this sort of wall crossing formula, Chekotin Waffer wall crossing formula, by looking at friend BPS degeneracies in this system. They did it by looking at say the TT star geometry of the two-dimensional theory, um, which is a sort of an intricate. Okay. So first of all, I need to break <laughs> down the symmetry of the Landau's Hilbert theory, a translation of two supercharges which means I need to put a defect in the landau input theory, which breaks translation symmetry and breaks half of the symmetry. Now, a uh, sort of familiar set of such defects is given by boundary conditions. You know, the, the most brutal way I can think of to, to break translation symmetry is just to put an end to the line, starting the theory in a half line with some boundary conditions. But it's a little bit too drastic for what I want to do. Instead, I want to still study the theory on the full line. But I will let the parameters for the full potential vary smoothly as a, as a function of the position. So my super potential is a function of the parameter z, and I let c vary as a function of the real line. I will keep the parameters far to the left and far to the right fixed to some specific values. 
and then I'll follow some path in parameter space between these two points. Now, if you just take the Lagrangian of uh, landau Ginzburg theory and you plug this in, you're going to get something that's not quite supersymmetric. And you need to correct it a little bit to make it supersymmetric. When you correct it, you actually need to pick which of the four, which linear combinations of the four supercharges you will preserve. And this is controlled by a, by a phase at the end. A useful way to think about this is that you're just doing a quantum mechanics in path space. So uh, you can take a the standard formulas of one, the one dimension of supersymmetric quantum mechanics and apply them to a functional of maps from the real line to, to your scalar manifold. Something like the integral in the X of, uh, uh, let me get it almost right at least. So this is sort of most function on the space of paths. Hmm? The imaginary part oh, imaginary. of uh, of the super potential. Is it's a choice of a phase, so oh, constant. constant. So for every choice of phase, you get a different tip, a different defect, and then you can ask what happens as you vary the path, the initial and final values of z and theta. Now, the formation, continuous deformations of the path don't do much. So you can, if now you can study this one-dimensional problem. You can, you can try to define uh, an index, even a Q-cohomology, if you want to categorify things. And this way, you're going to build some invariants some integral invariants, which are going to depend on, on many things. They're going to depend surely on the path and the initial, including the initial and final point. They're going to depend on the choice of vacuum, vacuum of for your theory and on theta. So you get a matrix of integers whose size is the uh, number of vacuum of your number of critical points of your superpotential. You can ask what does what do these integers mean? Now, first of all, it's not difficult to argue that they are homo an homotopy invariant for the path, meaning that if you deform your path a little bit, you deform the profile of your parameters a little bit in the middle, but you leave the endpoints fixed. These, these numbers are not going to change. So they only depend on the homotopy class of this path. Another fun thing you can do is that, suppose you want to study a path which goes from some g left uh, to the right. I mean, suppose you want to, to write this path as the composition of two paths, p1 and p2. So you, you start your life with some jump in parameter space, okay? It was defining this defect. And probably if you want to take, think about it as a localized defect, you want to keep this jump pretty sharp. But these integers can be computed for whatever choice of your profile. You can do it very, very smooth. Or if you want to study the composition of two paths, you can just do first the jump, wait for one, and then do another one. So physically, you realized a, a certain genus, a certain defect, as two defects which are separated by an arbitrary amount of space. So I had a, I want to study a defect labeled by a part P, 
an echo in continuous deformity without changing the invariance into a difference for the part P1 and the difference for the part P2. Then locality basically tells you, because this is a massive theory, that all's gonna happen is that you have your Hilbert space decomposes into pieces where you have a certain choice of vacuum in the middle. And so the integral invariance associated to P just the sum over the intermediate vacuum, the integral of invariance associated to P1 and to P2. So this means that this matrix of integers uh, is really a, a very nice map from the groupoid of paths into matrices of integers, because if you compose paths, the matrix just gets multiplied. Yeah, theta is the same, always the same, sorry. For now, it's always the same. Hmm. Now, suppose that your path was trivial. Now, for this to be compatible, it must be obvious that if your path was trivial, the matrix is just the identity matrix. But, so, let me try to understand the meaning of this in integer invariance a little bit better. So, we're studying critical points of this functional. So we're studying the differential equation. Uh, let me just write it here. The same, the same equation I had before. But the difference from what we were doing before, we're studying solitons, is that now the parameters of the of the super potential vary as a function of position. So this is sort of a driven gradient flow. It doesn't have a conserved chart, a conserved quantity anymore. So these flows can exist for every value of theta. Now, uh, if you're not careful, right? If if you don't tune things well, your, your flow will go to infinity in a finite distance, of course. Particularly if your path was trivial, we know that the only way to, for generic theta, the only way you can have a solution is that you just sit at a critical point at all times. So in particular, if you, if you have a very, I mean, so because of this property, you can imagine decomposing your path into little subpaths and study the problem for each of these little paths. Now it's pretty clear that if I'm moving just a tiny little bit in the space of parameters very, very slowly, and, it, and, then, and I'm at some value of the parameter space for which there were no BPS solitons, I'm not gonna find any other solution for this besides something that hovers very close to a critical point very carefully. So for most of these paths, this matrix, this matrix of integers is just the identity matrix as it should. Because otherwise this formula would not make sense. We surely don't want these integers to, to jump in a completely wild way if you vary your, your initial and final values of z. On the other hand, there will be some places along the path where you do pass through a point in parameter space where a BPS state existed, where a solution of this equation for almost constant z exists, which is not trivial and jumps from different critical points. So now let me give a magnified version of that picture. What I'm saying is that in order to compute the number of solutions to these equations from some initial point to some final point along the path, what you need to do is to check when, is, when does this path cross the location where the BPS equations had a solution with constant z. So the locations are w, some w, the difference of superpotential between two critical points 
I called wij before, belongs to e to the minus i t tag, right? the real mix, the real number. Sorry. So these are sort of codimension, real codimension one walls in parameter space. This picture is drawn in parameter space. So I have walls where some PPA state of the of the land algorithm model exists. And at these walls, something can happen to this index. I can get a non-trivial contribution. It's not a contribution, must have the form. I mean, I must be able to just keep sitting whatever critical point I was, or jump from critical point I to critical point J along one of the possible slopes. So uh, in a sense, the, the contribution from the path that crosses a wall takes the form of a matrix which has a single non-zero of diagonal element, which I'll denote like this. So this is the unit matrix, matrix element, and this is just some integral number which counts, which is counting the, the solutions to these equations with constant z, which means it's counting the, the BPS particles of the two-dimensional theory. So you see very concretely how the BPS particles of the original, of the two-dimensional theory affect the properties of these frame BPS invariants. And actually in this case, the frame BPS invariants can be computed in terms of this, of the two-dimensional BPS particles invariant. Now, because this, so in, so in particular, given a path, the matrix N is just the product, the order product <coughs> of a bunch of these factors. For all the walls that are crossed by the path. Well, um, for a Landau input theory, typically yes. Uh, I, I haven't encountered a situation where this product would not be finite. Uh, but I also, because I mean, if it's an infinite product of integral of matrices with inter integral values, it's going to be rather tricky to get a, a sensible result. Um, anyway, so some, some important properties. Now we're going to write some important properties about these numbers from the properties of these numbers. A crucial property was homotopy invariance. Now these walls definitely can definitely meet. It's perfectly possible for the values of potential at a critical point i, j, and k, say, to align. But the problem is that the, that the matrices that you associate to each of these walls do not commute in general. For example, 1 plus E12, I should write up here, 1 plus E12, 1 plus E23 is definitely not the same as 1 plus E23, 1 plus E12. On the other hand, if you put a 1 plus e 1 3 in here, this would be some inequality. So um, it must be true that whenever the walls meet, two walls meet, new walls are created or destroyed in such a way that the product of S factors crossing one way or crossing the other way is the same, because this was not a special point as far as these integral invariants are concerned. This was not a singularity of parameter space. So I should be able to just have an homotopy that goes from this path to this path. So this derives for you the chakotty waffenwall crossing formula, which indeed states that if you associate one of these factor, matrix factors to each of the BPS particles of your standard Lindbergh theory, then the product of these factors ordered by, in an appropriate way by the phase or the sole potential uh, is constant across the wall of marginal stability. So for example, here, this describes a phenomenon where 
on the one side of the wall you had two particles, one between vacuum I and one and two, and one between vacuum two and three. On the other side of the wall you have three particles. A new particle from, from vacuum one to vacuum three has been created. Now, um, uh, unfortunately, I, I cannot keep talking about these two-dimensional systems, but there is a lot of fun things that can be understood about these integral invariants uh, in terms of Morse theory. Uh, for, for the one, ones in the audience who know what the left shed symbol is, <coughs> this integrals basically give you the, the, the basis transformation between the left shed symbols and some value of the parameters between the left shed symbols and some other values of the parameters. And you know it's interesting to think that these numbers actually are dimensions of vector spaces, and you can make contact to to start some to theories of uh, the right categories of symbols and, and things like that, uh, which allow you to study these vector spaces. Uh, I should also say that this setup can be usefully generalized to situations where your parameters, where you model a space X, your potentials were a little bit exotic and for example we got a certain amount of mileage in studying north with uh, with Witten by looking at uh, certain superpotential look at just someone's function of the superpotential in the space of uh, flat complex flat connections on a, on a manifold and then looking at these invariants because you can recover sort of things like the braid for representation for the Jones polynomials I mean, whenever, pretty much whenever you have a line dog input theory with an interesting parameter space, this gives you interesting representations of the homotopy involved <laughs> of the parameter space. Okay, but let me try to use the last maybe five minutes optimistically keep, uh, about the connection from 2D to 4D. So, you see, suppose you look at, you take, you look at one of the walls in, in parameter space. Let me just erase a little bit here. Okay. So to each of these walls, you have attached a certain difference of superpotentials, which is negative. Okay. So this difference of potential is a real number. Typically, will grow monotonically in one direction, decrease in the other direction. Um, and you can sort of follow a wall in the direction where the where this is becoming smaller and the absolute value of this is becoming smaller and smaller. Now two things can happen. Either this wall <coughs> at some point disappear in some wall crossing process because in a sense it has been created by other two walls. Or this number is just gonna go all the way to zero. So if I take a wall, I, I follow it backwards these numbers are additive as when you create new particles. So either it goes to zero, or this was created by two other particles whose numbers are smaller and I can follow them backwards all the way to another creation event or ultimately to zero. Now, when the difference of potential between two critical points is zero, the two critical points actually have to coincide. Because remember, this was not just the difference of potentials, it was the difference of potentials along a flow joining the two critical points. And this was a number which was increasing monotonically along the flow. So the only way it can be zero is if the two critical points are actually coinciding. So these walls always end on special logic where two critical points coincide. So some new massless, some, some new physics is happening. And just by, so near this logic, the superpotential can always be approximated with the cubic superpotential. You can study in detail <coughs> what sort of flows exist there, what sort of short flows, if you want, exist there. So how many lines come out of one of these points? You find out that there are always three lines coming out of type IJ, JI, or OJI, with a very specific S. So it's always things like one plus EIJ, pretty much. So this means that you can reco reconstruct the whole network of S lines. Because every last line either came out of a, of a wall crossing event or came out of a turning point or, or one of these points or two critical points coincide. So vice versa, I can just look at all these logic in, in parameter space and meet 
a wall, three walls from each of them, propagate the walls out, and if two walls meet, use the wall crossing formal to see what comes out, and just keep going until you populate the whole parameter space with walls. So the whole network of S walls is essentially captured just by the behavior of the local system of vacua on the parameter space and by these numbers. So I lost all the information about the hidden potential, only kept these numbers. Okay. Now, uh, you can just now forget about the hidden potential and just apply this construction to a, a more general set of numbers. And um, this is what leads to the four-dimensional setup. So essentially, when you have two-dimensional theory, lambda algebra theory, you always this, have these numbers. But if it's embedded in this four-dimensional, there's a difference in the four-dimensional theory, you have you still have these numbers, but they do not come from extremizing a super potential, which is a function of x and z. So you end up with some uh, multi-valued functions uh, and with more general properties. And something can happen that does not happen uh, in two dimensions, which is as you as you you can look at the behavior of this S network as you vary theta, the parameter of theta. You can encounter a situation where you have a wall of type 1, 2 going one way and a wall of type 2, 1 going the other way for some value of theta. And for some value of theta, they go the opposite, the opposite way. Now, this, this will not happen in the two dimensional theory because here, here W1, 2 is positive and, and here is, is negative. It's not possible for, for this to happen simultaneously. But when this is a difference in four dimensional theory, it can happen. And then you get a new type of discontinuity in your, in your integers. Because, you know, one two and two one walls do not commute. The result of doing this is different from the result of doing this. So there is a new way your integral invariance can jump by certain new type of transformation. This transformation turned out to be the transformation that considered and Soberman used to define their wall crossing formula. And so, uh, we finally connect back to the four-dimensional DPS space. And you can actually compute them because you can compute the S-network, you can compute the way it jumps and changes, and so you can compute the case transformation, you can compute the DPS spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. Now, to increase of this line, you cannot touch the corresponding KS factor. 
So it does any transformation. It depends on the between us. It's a stock. It's surely possible for these walls to meet. And it's surely true that the, when they meet, the walls have to be created using the highest formula. So the case formula can be seen as a compatibility condition on this network of K-walls in the column map, the column map, guaranteeing that the product of K-walls is an amount of the Other questions? Okay, let's, let's thank Favide again. And we'll resume at 10 o'clock.